Thank you, um, Alistair, for that. Um, and now we come to the, um, tonight's lecture um, by Warwick Rodwell. Um, Warwick is consultant architect at Westminster Abbey. Um, we all know him um, from the huge number um, of volumes he has brought out over many years in his archaeological surveys, in his care for the fabric in an official capacity, in the way he's able to then analyse the architecture for us at great sites such as Dorchester Abbey and Wells and Lichfield, and also keeping up the theme of these islands off the northeast, northwest coast of Europe, um, distinguished publications um, about the architecture and archaeology of uh, the island of Jersey. Um, in recent years, there have been um, great volumes that have come out on the Abbey, on his books on the Lantern Tower, on the Chapter House, and most recently um, with a breathtaking array of um, technical, historical, um, and uh, other kinds of analysis on the Coronation Chair. And also when we, I was round in the Abbey with him over the summer, um, he uh, is promising us to write up the work that's been done also on St. Margaret's Westminster sometime, and I'm sure that will all happen um, in the fullness of time. His title tonight is Researching Architectural History Through Archaeology, um, The Case of Westminster Abbey, Warwick. Thank you, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, I thought for the benefit of uh, younger members here who don't re uh, recall how things have proceeded over the last 50 years to get where we are today with the archaeology of buildings, that I would start with a little preamble on uh, earlier things before I became involved with Westminster Abbey. So it's a two-part talk, very short introduction, which I will look at one or two other buildings and how they have contributed uh, uh, to architectural history through the medium of archaeology, and then get on to the Abbey, uh, which could keep us here all night if I talk about everything. However, um, I shall um, attempt to uh, be brief in this. Now, if you were um, uh, an archaeologist 50 years ago, uh, you would have found that there was a total divide between archaeology and architectural history. They did not meet. There was a Berlin Wall. Uh, and archaeology was dealt with by bodies like the Ministry of Works, and architectural history was dealt with by the Royal Commission on Historical Monuments. There was no liaison at all. Uh, they were quite separate subjects. Archaeologists were expected to get muddy and dig holes in the ground and appear as though they had just come out of the ground at all times, whereas architectural historians uh, wore cravats and suits and appeared uh, quite differently. Well, that was the world into which I was born. And uh, 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 archaeology um, was the subject that I always wanted to pursue from the time when I was about four, um, there, down there. Uh, but it, it began in, uh, exactly 50 years ago, as far as I'm concerned, in uh, uh, the, the, the work that, that I did in 1963 on the demolition of a rectory site, uh, a rectory building um, in Essex at Sutton. And as a schoolboy, I went, uh, and it's quite an accident that I got into architectural history because I actually went ghost hunting at this haunted rectory. And I looked at it while it was being demolished uh, and thought, there's an awfully big story here. There's a building, a timber framed, uh, with uh, added wings in red brick that are Georgian and yellow brick that are Victorian and so on. There's a great story here. Uh, and I was interested in it. There was nothing in Pevsner, 1954. It wasn't mentioned. The Royal Commission volume, uh, 1923, uh, on southeast Essex, um, only gave it one paragraph and said it was a 17th century L-shaped building with some modern additions. And I spent the Christmas of 63 recording this because the contractors who were demolishing it went home for Christmas and that left me with the building. And uh, I recorded it and produced my first sort of architectural history of a building. Nobody taught me how to do it. I didn't know anything about it. I, I invented it as I went. But I was able to show that there was much more than the recorded history told us. And that set me off um, on a, a quest to think about the, uh, the archaeology and architecture of buildings that had not been adequately studied, those that received no mention in historical uh, texts or those which only received a one paragraph. 
And so uh, that um, uh, uh, quest begun 50 years ago um, took me on to look at a lot more buildings in Essex. And with my school friend, Paul Drury, we rode our bicycles around the county measuring and recording buildings from medieval to 19th century that were being demolished, that great swathe of 1960s and 1970s demolitions which destroyed entire towns like Chelmsford and all the wonderful medieval and later buildings in the Molsham area of Chelmsford that just wiped out. Um, and Paul and I uh, did what we could to record a number of those. But we were only two schoolboys and then latterly two students uh, um, at, at colleges and so on uh, recording these things. Well, in the course um, um, of, of doing that, uh, we, we uh, got involved, of course, really being archaeologists, in excavations and so on at a number of places. And one of those that uh, uh, came to um, our um, attention and which um, I had to run excavations at was Rivenhall in Essex. We, uh, uh, we were looking at a Roman villa that was having a, a sewer pipeline driven through it, destroying a great swathe through the Roman villa, which was behind the church. And the church, uh, we could see, was uh, uh, on the site of a second Roman building as part of one of these great Gallo-Roman trapezoidal villa plans. I'm really a Romanist at heart, that's where I was brought up, uh, but I've strayed a little over the years. Uh, and uh, so looking at the church at Rivenhall, I'm thinking about the subject of how did we get from a Roman villa to a church? Uh, uh, is there a connection between these things? And again, this was the sort of question that was not being asked in the 1960s and early 70s. Um, when uh, Ian Richmond wrote the volume three of the Victoria County History of Essex, 1963, it was all devoted to Roman Essex, he said you know, there are 58 churches in Essex that sit on the sites of Roman villas, but in the nature of things they are not susceptible of investigation. And I thought, well, that needs to change. We need to find out what's under these churches and how we may or may not link them to the Roman period. And so the archaeology, the idea of archaeology coming out of the ground and into standing buildings, which was not a subject then uh, pursued, other than in respect of ruins of medieval monasteries, which uh, some archaeologists uh, uh, excavated, the, but the, the idea of looking at living buildings was not then possible in archaeological terms. So... Ribbonhall Church. Um, it receives uh, a very brief mention uh, in the Royal Commission because it was rebuilt in 1838. And there's a brass plaque on the wall inside which says that, that uh, Baron Weston of Ribbonhall rebuilt this church from a rude and unseemly structure, 1838-39. Um, well, this is what he rebuilt, this cement box, you know, the chancel here. Uh, and I, I looked at it and I thought, well, it's interesting because where a bit of rendering had fallen away up there where I put the arrow, there was a couple of Roman bricks on a tilt. And I thought, are they an arch or a um, fragment of, of a little um, arch of Roman bricks? So being an archaeologist, I carried a shovel in the back of the car and I used that shovel to excavate a trench down <laughs> the, the side of the window, as you can see, one shovel's width trench. And, of course, what it revealed was the two Roman bricks that I had seen uh, were the top of a jam of uh, an 11th century, late 10th or 11th century, uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon window. So, um, the, uh, uh, we were looking at a Roman site, and here was uh, evidently an Anglo-Saxon building sitting on top of that Roman building. So, the archaeology began to uh, close up. So, I thought, well, uh, this building needs a little more attention, um, and therefore a little more shovel work <laughs> on there because I thought if there's a window here there's probably going to be one somewhere here and the shovel um, conveniently removed a great deal more um, cement rendering and of course a sec you will have a job to sit a second Anglo-Saxon window appeared there well we then substituted the shovel for more orderly methods of dealing with things and stripped the whole wall uh, and uh, of course there we are one Anglo-Saxon window another one in there 14th century uh, um, uh, window arch above this cement one, another 14th century window blocked in there, um, the beginnings of an apse of the 11th century disappearing under the chancel there, a 14th century buttress there, and so on, on it goes. So 
archaeology in a very short time was able to turn round the history of that church. Um, it wasn't rebuilt in 1838. It was clad in cement and pinnacles and parapets and so on were put on and all these fake windows. But uh, the archaeological contribution um, suddenly gave us an Anglo-Saxon and medieval church. And that um, rather turned me into a church archaeologist, which I'm, I've been for a rather a long time since then. This was 1971 uh, and 72 when we were working on this. So um, a decade after the, the foray into the, uh, the rectory demolition and the ghost hunting. So um, the, Rivenhall uh, then set um, a new uh, standard as far as I was concerned, but it didn't for everybody else because I was given a carpeting by a senior inspector at English Heritage because I spent funds on recording a building. And that was not to be done because the funds that I was supposed to be using at Rivenhall were for excavation only and you don't record buildings with archaeological money. And again, I thought that's another subject that needs to change. Uh, and we fought uh, uh, over that um, uh, subsequently, of course, and now it's perfectly normal. Archaeologists recall buildings. Uh, but, as I say, 40 and 50 years ago, this was just not acceptable. So, anyway, I weathered the carpeting and carried on recording the building and got money from elsewhere um, to, to uh, carry on and do it. Uh, and so w one was able to see uh, that there was a great archaeology that took us out of the foundations, which we were excavating, up through the building to the pinnacles and parapets, and that it was all one continuous story. Uh, well, we're, there, it's almost superfluous to say that now, because this is what we do. But um, anyone who wasn't uh, um, active in the world of, of architectural history and archaeology 40 or 50 years ago um, may not um, realise that. So this is how things went. Well, um, those were, that was for buildings effectively unknown. Then there are buildings that are very well known and about which a good deal has been written. And if we go to somewhere like Wilbury House in Wiltshire, um, a great um, uh, Palladian revival house, um, uh, uh, allegedly um, designed by William Benson, the Royal Surveyor, in 1710, but actually designed by Colin Campbell, who published in Vitruvius Britannicus in 1715. Uh, and uh, Wilbury, well known and uh, discussed by John Bold in his magnificent book on Wilton House and uh, Wiltshire Palladianism, we have two drawings by, by Campbell. We have a, uh, a south elevation and we have um, a ground floor plan, a piano nobile plan, a slightly raised ground floor. And that um, is what everyone has had to work on in terms of understanding the history of this building. And there um, we see it um, in the 19th century, uh, the, the north front in this case. I know it says south front there, but it's wrong. On, on the, uh, the artist got it wrong. It's the north front, and here's uh, John Bold's plans from, from the Royal Commission. And so one was able to see, and, and, and it, this was described in the Royal Commission, that there was the, the Palladian Revival building in the core, with later wings added, uh, and then an upper story added. Now, that was how things stood. And then when in 1997, um, the, uh, the, the lovely um, uh, Miranda Countess of Ivor, who sadly died a little while ago, um, she bought this house um, and uh, she asked me, is there any more we can say about it um, other than what's in the Royal Commission? And uh, I had the privilege of uh, pulling the house to pieces for a long time while she was uh, preparing plans for its uh, renovation. And in the course of all that work, we looked at it uh, uh, in very great detail and showed that, yes, the uh, Vitruvius Britannicus plan is essentially there on the, the ground floor, except that Vitbrit did not put the northern portico in, which, although rebuilt later, is an original feature of it. Uh, but what we, um, uh, with the great surprise that came was, of course, that the upper floor, which everybody had assumed was a later addition, was in fact an original floor, in part. So, in terms of discovering that, it immediately changed um, Wilbury from being a villa, um, probably um, used from Amesbury, which of course was the parent house in a sense, um, thought to be just a villa to which uh, the family resorted and uh, had picnics and so on. It changed it to being a full residential house, because it didn't just have uh, one, one floor and some rooms in a basement, 
It had a complete um, uh, chamber floor with four major chambers, dressing rooms, and so on, all up there. And the evidence for that was all concealed um, because when I went upstairs, I realized that the ceilings downstairs and the floors upstairs didn't match. And there was a three-foot gap between them. So if you took the floors up upstairs and dropped down into the hole, you suddenly found yourself in the remains of the first floor of the original 1710 house. With all the fireplaces, the, fire, the hearths and so on, um, a lot of the floorboarding, everything still intact, um, the beginnings of flights of steps that linked the different levels, and so you could plan the entire missing first floor that was then encased in 1786 in the present first floor uh, and, uh, and discover that this house was a much bigger house than, than one thought. Then there was the basement to look at. Well, there was the, the, the basement. Um, uh, when, again, we stripped it out and looked at it in detail, it was obvious that it was a basement not just for um, making sandwiches for a party house or anything like that. It was a full working place with big kitchen fireplaces, ovens and so on, uh, 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 butler's rooms, uh, wine and beer cellars, uh, the servants' hall, uh, uh, and all these uh, sort of major rooms that one wants, plus what was never realised was that there was other um, ranges that had been demolished. So three doors going out of the basement here into a, a western courtyard and another range demolished out there, presumably sculleries and storage and so on, related to the kitchens. And out here, um, a, an eastern uh, um, uh, yard uh, and then blocked doorways and a blocked staircase leading down to something which we never uh, got into, which was a sub-cellar. So there was another tier of cellarage filled in underneath. Um, I, I, of course, being an archaeologist, wanted to excavate it and look at it, but uh, Miranda Iver had a wonderful way of saying no in the most charming way, which I could somehow get round. I don't like no as a word. It's very uh, unconducive to research. Uh, but uh, we, we didn't excavate it. It would have been a massive problem. But it's down there. There is a second um, cellar tier um, down underneath the, this one. So um, it, it, this whole um, building turned into something much, much bigger. Of course, the south front, as the, as the elevation in Vitruvius Britannicus shows, has no windows at first floor level. It just has some panels with William Benson's initials and, and so on, on. So you could be forgiven for saying there was no first floor. But it was there. It was hidden. And it had windows down both sides. Um, and it had blind windows on the north face, apart from two that led into lobbies. All these windows had been uh, uh, lost in the course of a later development, but archaeologically they weren't lost. When you took the rendering off, you found the sills and the bottoms of them. Or when you were in the gap between the two floors, the upper and lower floors, again, bits of the windows were there. And one way and another, we were able to plot all the, uh, the fenestration um, of the lost upper floor and to recover this whole um, construction of a major house of 1710, uh, which was not, as I say, just a little villa with a few rooms on one floor. So uh, this, um, I, I hope, shows you that um, architectural uh, uh, history can be hugely enriched by a little bit of archaeological investigation when the opportunity arises. Of course, you can't do this if people are living in the house and it's full of furniture and, and fine carpets and so on. It needs to be uh, the opportunity taken when the house is empty or changing hands or, the, or if a church is being refurbished or whatever it is, the opportunity to carry out the research um, on a, a grand scale uh, and to look at everything properly. Uh, I mean, Wilbury is almost a carbon copy of the story we, of what we did at Lodge Park, at Sherburn in Gloucestershire. Again, meant to be just a deer coursing lodge with um, two rooms on the ground floor, a great party room on the first floor, and a viewing gallery on the top with a staircase connecting them. But again, when we did the archaeology, an entire basement area which was filled in came to light. Rear wings that, uh, that had been demolished came to light. And again, it was a house you could live in with staff uh, and, and so on. And so it wasn't just um, a, a party house uh, for watching deer coursing. Well, those are ways that we can enlarge on the history of known major buildings. Now, what can we do in, in archaeology for, uh, for the tragedy case? And this is the worst thing I've ever done in my life, and that was to demolish Soane's only house um, in the Channel Islands. Um, this is Columbury House uh, in Jersey, which uh, was condemned to death. Uh, and in 1997, I had the job of supervising its demolition. Uh, and this uh, is an extraordinarily sad story, because... 
the, uh, the, the, the Sir John Soane Museum has five drawings, which includes a front elevation here, um, here's a ground plan, uh, and several other drawings, of a house built for a man called Clement Hemery um, in St. Helier in Jersey. Uh, and it, the, 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 the de- they're not dated, but in fact the date is 1809. And these are some bits of drawings, parts of drawings, that have survived from Soane's office. And this building, of which we see the front and back elevations in 1997, um, was, of course, the house. Uh, and uh, there was a determination to demolish it, absolute determination. Uh, and it went through a whole series of proceedings and appeals, and everybody from the Prince of Wales and the Queen Mother downwards supported the retention of this. Marcus Binney headed the, the, the campaign to save it. Uh, Ptolemy Dean um, heralded all the Sonian uh, interest in it, and so on. But still, um, uh, 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 it was uh, doomed for demolition. And um, I was quite convinced that had we done the archaeology of this building before it went to the Royal Court for the final decision, that we would have been able to prove that it was Soane's. Because the uh, people who wished to demolish it, to make money for, with an office block on the site, of course, uh, claimed that it was not Soane, um, and they employed um, an absolutely disreputable um, architect to say that, um, who in his report said, if Soan could see this, he would be disgusted. Uh, well, um, this did not ring any um, bells with, with some of us, uh, and when it was finally um, sealed that it was to be demolished, uh, uh, we gained an, a stay of execution for five weeks, when I took two teams in, a team of archaeologists and a team of builders, and we took it to pieces, uh, leaving just a shell for the bulldozers to, to knock over uh, at the end. Uh, we saved all the interior, took everything out, every last window um, uh, and uh, door case and architrave and so on, took the whole lot out. Uh, and, and the National Trust for Jersey have all this material which they are reusing. So this um, was a terrible story. The interior had been all divided up, of course, into offices, false ceilings, false wall linings. Everything was impossible to see. And that was the basis upon which decisions had been taken. And these wonderful Sony, like the, the, here is the, the, the entrance hall, uh, front door there. He didn't, put, he didn't put the portico on, although he built it later. He didn't put the portico on these drawings. Uh, but um, the, sorry, that one, the, the entrance hall there um, with its wonderful Sonian bow at the end and then the drawing room here also bowed. Um, well, those bows weren't there. And so this was part of the argument, oh, well, Sone didn't, didn't build it. Um, it. It isn't him. Uh, well, of course, um, that's uh, just a superficial view of things. When we pulled down all the partitions and got rid of all the rubbish, what happens on the floor? There are the scars, exactly um, the walls were all there, and they'd been taken down. They were lath and plaster walls, of course, uh, and they'd all been there as per Sohn had drawn them. Uh, and uh, had we had that archaeological evidence when it went to the Royal Court, I don't doubt for one moment that we would have saved this building. But it was ignorance and money uh, uh, and arrogance that secured the demolition of this magnificent house uh, of Soane's. But that's the way it went. Now, uh, those are the sort of problems that one deals with over the course of of one's life as an architectural archaeologist. Um, facing uh, these uh, uh, wonderful challenges to discover the, the um, unknown histories of buildings, but also to deal with tragedies uh, like the, the destruction of, uh, of Columbury House. Three months later, I pulled down a wonderful 17th century house in Jersey for the same reason, but um, a controlled demolition uh, was better than, uh, than uh, uh, getting nothing out of it. Well, um, in the last 10 years, um, I have devoted my attentions very largely to Westminster Abbey uh, and given up cathedrals and and other buildings and the Channel Islands and so on in order to do this. Now, um, I was preceded at Westminster by my my uh, great friend, Tim Tatton Brown, who's here tonight, um, and so um, I really carry on work that he started there. But let's go back a little bit. The first thing with Westminster Abbey is, it's not a building you can shut down. It's never going to be empty. You can't do the sort of archaeology there that you would do in these houses where you absolutely pull them apart um, uh, prior to demolition or restoration or whatever. 
Westminster is a living building, continuing for the same purpose as it was constructed, uh, to hold great services, great weddings, uh, funerals, state funerals, and so on. And so um, it is a building that has a very different uh, uh, set of needs and uh, calls on the archaeologist. Now, Tim and I are by no means the first archaeologists to have taken an interest in Westminster. These people, um, Scott and Letterby, who produced great volumes, um, would not have called themselves archaeologists. They were, of course, ar um, architects. And yet, they were immensely interested in archaeology and spent a great deal of time studying the, uh, the constructional details of the abbey and its furnishings and writing about its fixtures and fittings and uh, looking at the craftsmen, as the titles tell us, you know, the craftsmen who were involved in, in building and altering these structures. So, they were buildings are archaeologists of the 19th and early 20th century, uh, although, as I say, the term was not used. Scott used the word archaeology a great deal, as you will see at the very end, um, but um, uh, they, they were nevertheless architects, they were surveyors of the fabric to the abbey, um, and that was their prime concern. But they took the trouble to do a lot of archaeological recording. Now, for a building of such enormous complexity and interest, it is quite staggering that the first plan that was ever produced of it, um, that is in any sense um, usable or accurate, is the 1921 Royal Commission plan, which shows the, 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 the abbey, the cloister, the little cloister here, uh, the, and the various ancillary buildings all around it here, and some of them running down here, uh, which became part of Westminster School, which occupies um, all, all uh, this area. So um, that was the first sort of plan. But of course, like all Royal Commission plans at that date, it was not a, nothing uh, that was 18th or 19th century was of any interest, and that was just omitted or put on as a, a pale outline. Uh, and of course, it's been damaged uh, by the war since then. A lot of changes have occurred. And so we have resurveyed the abbey uh, using uh, laser scanners and so on, uh, and the school is being resurveyed too. So that, uh, at last, we have got a digital um, uh, plan which deals with everything from St Margaret's Church which is off the top of the picture right the way down through the school uh, and so uh, the first great uh, uh, and complete survey um, of this uh, I'm sorry what did I do there of this whole complex oh what have I done with that help how do I do it I went to press the wrong button by accident I pressed oh one. you can't see it here can you is that oh right yeah because it's hidden there Thank you very much. Right, um, yeah, that, that's it. Um, so uh, the, the, the Abbey uh, has undergone um, a, 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 a series of, 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 of archaeological studies of Victorian and Edwardian uh, concern, and then it really fell um, into uh, an abyss. And the abyss, of course, uh, it relates to the period of the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s. 1941... It was heavily firebombed, uh, and the, this is the lantern tower over the crossing, uh, which uh, was, was burnt out, and that's what it looked like on the floor in the crossing the next morning. So uh, there was huge damage uh, done then. The, uh, the deanery, which um, has been described by John Goodall as the most complete uh, medieval courtyard house in London, um, was also firebombed, and the part which the dean lives in today, it was formerly, of course, the medieval um, abbot's house, um, that the part that the dean lives in today is largely a post-1941 uh, reconstruction. Nevertheless, it's a huge medieval uh, uh, abbot's house complex. Tragically, all of this was rebuilt after the war without a jot of archaeological or architectural recording. Nothing was done at all. And so uh, great swathes um, of, of the abbey were repaired and reconstructed. And the little cloister was largely rebuilt by Seely and Paget. And again, nothing whatsoever recorded. We lost so much. Um, had archaeologists been ava available or involved, then it would have been uh, uh, a great... Uh, day for discovery. I mean, a tragedy that had happened, but the opportunity for discovery and recording uh, and enrichment of the Abbey's history uh, was totally lost. As indeed it was uh, it, when Dykes Bower became surveyor, the most disastrous surveyor of the 20th century, or, or, or of recent centuries, as far as the Abbey is concerned. Um, he destroyed 
in his surveyorship more of the historic fabric of Westminster Abbey than two world wars and all other surveyors of the 20th century. It's enormous the destruction that he carried out. He's known for the destruction of the medieval roofs, Henry III's great roofs, which Christopher Stell um, recorded the last surviving bits for the Royal Commission in 1965, but the bulk of the medieval roofs were already destroyed by then. So was the canopy of the shrine. So were many, many other areas um, of the abbey wiped out uh, and replaced um, in, the, in the, the Knights Bower era. So this is, again, an, e an era when there was no recording, nothing done, apart from this one exercise, which, of course, the row that this generated led to questions being raised in both Houses of Parliament, petitions to the Queen and so on, to stop this man in his saga of destruction um, of Westminster Abbey. Um, and, well, he was stopped in due course, but, I mean, that it was really too late, in a sense. Um, what happened? How has it jumped all that long? Oh, right. Okay. Um, so, nothing really happens about the proper recording of Westminster until Tim Pratt and Brown comes on the scene, 1990, and he starts on the West Front. Donald Buttress was then the surveyor of the fabric, uh, and uh, a, a great campaign uh, uh, spearheaded by the uh, Duke of Edinburgh um, to uh, 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 clean and repair the West Front uh, began. And many of you will know this drawing, which uh, Tim published in the Antigris Journal, which shows his uh, brilliant analysis of the uh, archaeology of the West Front, the different phases. I'm not going to go into that tonight, but um, it's all there. Uh, the first analysis of how the West Front developed from the, uh, the 14th century work at low level through to Hawksmoor, uh, 1735, at the high level, and all sorts of things that happened in between. Uh, plus the possibility that encased behind the 14th century work are the bases of 12th century towers, uh, which we are going to look at a little more in due course. But this was really the first modern exercise in archaeological study um, at the Abbey. And uh, I, I put that on just for fun because the West Front of the Abbey, of course, has given rise to a great many um, inspirations, including the, the whole business of skeleton clocks, um, which um, the Great Exhibition of 1851 championed, and that is one that's based on the West Front of the Abbey. Tim then went on to look at Henry VII's chapel and carried out the same sort of detailed archaeological analysis and produced a magnificent volume on the chapel in conjunction with a group of other scholars uh, whereby um, they looked at all sorts of things from finding the remnants of the plan of the lost Henry III um, uh, Lady Chapel of 1220 uh, through to studying uh, the, uh, the structure of the stalls and so on, uh, which was... Um, done by Julian Munby, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, so a, a very valuable volume on the architectural history um, bolstered by archaeology was produced um, on the uh, Henry VII Chapel. Uh, and, and that uh, gave us, for the first time, a fully rounded uh, study of a particular portion of the Abbey. Of course, over the course of time, huge numbers of scholars have written immensely important and erudite papers on individual tombs or individual aspects, but the beginnings of looking at a whole chunk of the abbey and recording it um, uh, by a series of scholars uh, so that you get the most out of it um, is something of a relatively uh, recent uh, vintage, and really it's, it's this Henry VII work that, that begins it. Now, uh, the, uh, the, the archaeology um, of, of um, the early part of the Abbey has fascinated uh, people uh, for a very long time. And uh, Eric Fernie, of course, um, produced uh, th this plan and has, has written about it. Uh, and I am hesitant about saying anything here tonight in Eric's presence. Uh, but uh, the, the whole subject of the previous Abbey, the archaeology of what's gone, uh, it, it has fascinated everyone and comparing it with the Bayer tapestry, or not comparing, as, as, as it, 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 they don't compare too well on some grounds, but I think we can explain quite a lot in, in Bayer, um, as I did when I did the, the, the volume on the Lantern Tower uh, and, and, and discussed this whole problem of what went on in the centre of the Abbey. But there are parts of, of, of the 11th century work still standing as um, around the picture chamber, the darker masonry, the dark bits, 
between, uh, between the 13th century shafts and the 14th century doorway and so on, they are 11th century. They are part of the confessor's work. So there's still bits to be seen above ground um, of that um, and, uh, and properly recorded. And the Pix Chamber, which we've all known um, is part of the great undercroft of the dormitory range in the East Cloister, that bit, um, now that we have carried out detailed um, surveys of it and, and studies of it, we um, are able to show that that, that bit um, is a fragment of the mid-11th century work um, of the Confessor's period and that the rest of the undercroft is joined on um, perhaps um, 1070 or thereabouts, is a later addition. So uh, the East Cloister Walk, um, uh, with the chapter house um, and the, uh, uh, be uh, the beginnings of this, this part, um, were, were all still there um, until Henry the, the III um, started demolishing. Um, and of course, he, he stopped demolishing at this point. Uh, with his new chapter house and vestibule, so he cut off the end of, of the confessor's uh, work, and it just leaves us with two bays floating between Henry III up here and the 1070s work down here. So um, all of this, um, by um, archaeological uh, uh, investigation and minute study of the whole structure, stone by stone, and the geology, the, the, the tooling, the mason's marks, and all the other evidence, um, it is possible to separate this out. Well, something else which um, has long intrigued uh, us uh, is the question of this old door in the chapter house vestibule. There it is. It, is. it was hung there in the 13th century by Henry III when rebuilding the chapter house vestibule, circa 1250. Uh, and it's a cut-down door. Um, everybody's recognised that. And Cecil Hewitt, the great carpentry man, um, who was working with me um, in 1974 at Hadstock Church uh, near Cambridge when we were looking at the dating of, of early doors and so on there, Cecil said, I'm sure the door um, in the uh, chapter house vestibule at uh, Westminster is the oldest door in England and is um, Anglo-Saxon. Well, it took us um, a long time to get the, uh, uh, around eventually to the dendrochronology of this and getting the permissions and so on. But when we uh, did st uh, study it in 2005 um, and did dendrochronology on it, of course it came out as circa 1060, and so it is an Edward the Confessor door, the only uh, one surviving, the earliest door in, in, in the country. So it's, it's, it's a fragment that's been rehung from the Confessor's uh, Abbey. And when you reconstruct it, it's battered and damaged and it's had the top sawn off and so on. When you reconstruct it um, uh, and, and put the hinges back on, uh, the scars are all there from the hinges and indeed the central strap with its divided curls is still there. But when you put the evidence back together, that's what you get is an eight foot high door, four feet wide. Uh, and so you are able uh, at last to reconstruct a, a, a genuine Anglo-Saxon door. Uh, however, I argue that since there is um, animal skin under the hinges and under the strap work, uh, which shows signs of red paint on it, that in fact what you really saw was not a, a brown oak door full of cracks and knots and shakes, but you actually saw a red painted skin uh, a door, uh, which probably had gilding and decoration and so on on it, which we'll never know about. But it's in the tradition that we see Anglo-Saxon wooden shields were covered with, uh, with leather and then decorated. Uh, and all the way through, we find it in medieval and post-medieval chests and other um, items that are covered with um, a skin painted uh, and decorated. So that I think we see a glimpse here of the, the basic uh, evidence for um, what uh, an Anglo-Saxon door in the Abbey uh, may have looked like. Then there's the blindingly obvious that we never see. And that is the case with these. Uh, these um, uh, 11th century hand-decorated tiles. Each one is de decorated by hand incisions or compass circles drawn on it. Um, these um, blindingly obvious because they're on the floor in the Pix chamber and yet they had never been noticed until we were doing the survey there um, in 2005. And they are amongst the earliest um, glazed uh, floor tiles um, that exist in this country. And there are also a few polychrome ones uh, uh, from uh, various um, late Saxon sites um, in, in England, including uh, one from uh, Westminster dug up in the, uh, uh, the, the undercroft, actually, next door uh, to the Pix Chamber, in, dug up in the undercroft in 1987. So um, they, uh, that, that is a, a decorated, relief decorated polychrome tile. 
these are crudely incised. But so, and that, more elements which tell us about the appearance of, of the uh, 11th century buildings um, uh, can be gleaned from uh, uh, traces like this. Hmm. Why did that? I don't know why it's just jumping on when I go near it, but still. Oh, I know, it's probably because I'm leaning on the, the button there. Right, okay. Uh, it's all this newfangled technology. What's wrong with slides, I ask? Um, right, uh, so the, uh, we, it has caused us to look now at the archaeology of this whole uh, southern area of the abbey where there are fragments surviving um, of 11th and 12th century buildings in the, the refectory range, the dormitory range, the rear daughter, uh, there's the kitchen remains of, of that and so on. Uh, and Richard Jem drew attention to this um, uh, uh, many years ago, um, all these glazed tiles, and here we are again, 11th century brown glazed tiles um, with uh, stonework in a checker pattern, which is the northwest corner of the refectory, upstairs, high level, they're up, up um, uh, on the first floor, external corner. And so they give us a glimpse um, of the external decoration of the 11th century uh, buildings here uh, at Westminster. And when you look at drawings made in the 19th century of Westminster Hall, um, or of course, um, th this was long altered, there is this checker pattern. Sadly, there's no description to go with it that I'm aware of, but there is a checker pattern um, uh, at the uh, parapet level of the 11th century hall. And I would lay a small wager, if I were a betting person, uh, on the fact that it was very much like the, the um, 11th century abbey work. So... Um, we're gradually, I think, learning more about those ancillary buildings um, of, of the Abbey uh, through taking every opportunity there is to record. Now, in the last couple of years, the, uh, the, the, the solarium range here, um, which runs off the, uh, the cloisters up, up, up there, the, uh, the, that, that's the sort of southwest corner of the cloister, the solarium range, which is not a cloister range but actually projects down beyond the cloister, was developed uh, or redeveloped to make uh, the present abbey refectory. Well, it's a 14th century range as it stands, and the opportunity for excavation took place uh, uh, in conjunction with the building works, and that gave us a new dimension. It gave us not only the archaeological evidence relating to the foundations of all this area to do with the Misericord, the south side of the 11th century refectory, the corner of the kitchen which turned up um, in the excavation, but also the red bit, um, which is this thing, which is uh, a much earlier, the earliest uh, 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 structure of the abbey known, probably of Dunstan's period, certainly the 10th century. And so that... Um, archaeological opportunity not only enlightened us on the standing buildings and their foundations but gave us a new phase um, uh, of, of uh, what was hitherto lost. So opportunities have to be taken at Westminster but you can also cre uh, when they occur um, through development work but you can also create an opportunity sometimes um, which we did uh, in uh, 2008 for the Society of Antiquaries uh, Tercentenary Research Symposium, um, as our president knows, as he's in, been involved in this. And uh, we brought together um, a dozen or so scholars, again, to do uh, like Tim had done on the Henry VII Chapel, but to tackle the chapter house. So historians and art historians and architectural historians and archaeologists and everybody who had some uh, thing uh, to uh, some specialist knowledge of the chapter house, we brought together. And I tried to cover everything, from the tile floors to the glass in the windows to the vaulting, to, the, to, to every aspect of it, so that we could enrich our knowledge of the architectural history of this magnificent um, chapter house, which, of course, Matthew Paris um, described in glowing terms after Henry III had built it, finished about 1253-54, um, that sort, sort of date, um, and, and glowing terms as um, uh, uh, being um, uh, exceptional, um, as, as I think, didn't we put in the... Yes, um, a, a chapter house beyond compare. That's Matthew Paris's words um, after he had seen it. So um, this was an opportunity to uh, bring everyone together and to produce uh, a conference and then a volume as we did um, on the chapter house. 
And um, in it, we were able to tackle for the first time a number of thorny problems that had been waiting to be tackled for years. And this is one I'd been itching to get at for years. I started on it in 2000 and, and spent several years on and off looking at it. And that's the problem of what was the crypt under the chapter house. Now, chapter houses are normal, normally single-storey buildings that they sit on the ground and that's it. But uh, Westminster has a chamber underneath, half the diameter of, of, of the, the chapter house above, great thick walls as you see, but this, this octagonal crypt. Wells Cathedral has the other surviving one like this, where it, it, isn't, it isn't a small crypt, it's the full size of the chapter house because there's a second <coughs> ring of columns and the double vaulting, uh, um, uh, so it's, it's, and it's about 10, 12 years after um, uh, the Westminster. So um, we have these two remarkable chapter houses. There was a third one at Beverley Minster, which was lost at the Reformation. Uh, and in a sense, there's a fourth one at Lichfield, which is the other way up, and the chapter house is on the ground floor, and upstairs you've got the monument room and, and library. Again, a great vaulted structure. So this remarkably interesting uh, series of, of, of buildings, of which presumably this was the first, we think, uh, uh, to be constructed, and why? How did this fashion come about? to produce the double-storied octagonal chapter house. And every, the, 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 the clue to all this had to lie in, this, in what was this basement for. Well, of course, it's always gone down in, in the history books as being a royal treasury. Uh, indeed, it was a royal treasury from Edward I onwards, but not under Henry III. Uh, and it was, it was Edward I who moved uh, two of the royal treasuries into the abbey, one into the chapter house under Croft here, or Crypt here, and the other into the Picts Chamber. Uh, but uh, what was it designed for? And so we carried out a detailed archaeological study um, of all, all of this, and this extraordinary passage, this is Poet's Corner in the Abbey, and you go through a little door and along a little narrow passage and down some steps, then turn a right angle through another door, down a lot more steps, then another right angle, and you appear in this, this chamber. Um, or there's a, there's a larger plan of, of that journey that you've just made. Well, there is a big heavy door across here and evidence of lots of locks and bolts and so on, which you'd expect if it was a royal treasury. Uh, but what had never been noticed was the archaeological evidence for how all this came about. Uh, and um, once it, it became clear that all the doors and the locks and bolts were secondary, one realised that in fact this, this um, so-called treasury was in fact open to the interior of the abbey with no door of any sort to stop you. Uh, in other words, it clearly was not built as a treasury. That's the one thing you can say, uh, because treasuries without doors tend to be a sort of help yourself. Um, I and mean, it's better than a buy one, get one free job, isn't it? You know? uh, so um, the treasury was a secondary use for it. Um, I then devoted effort to looking at the side walls, that, this wall here, which is, which is that wall there. Because the side wall was covered in scars, which I've done in yellow there, of former flights of steps and so on. And part of the steps in, in the steps in here, uh, they changed from being stone down to wooden steps there. Uh, and uh, the whole thing was a hodgepodge. And gradually, through various sources, uh, archaeological and topographical and historical, we were able to work out what had happened. That this was indeed an underground chapel. Um, and the, uh, and the, it had an altar in the east side, uh, an ombre and a piscina in the flanks of, the, uh, of, of that, that recess. And so it was a chapel, fully accessible from the interior of the abbey with no obstruction of great locked doors. Uh, and uh, that um, it was rather a pokey journey to get down there and not a lot of headroom on the original flight of steps. Question is, why was it there? What was it for? Well, when you think about the, uh, the, the problem of Henry III building the new chapter house and its vestibule, the first thing you have to think of is he had to demolish the confessor's chapter house. And that, in its vestibule, had all the Norman abbots buried in the vestibule. So what happens to the Norman abbots uh, when you demolish all this? You've got to dig them up and move them. And they were moved, temporarily, there's the tomb of one of them, into the South Cloister. And I think the answer is that, in fact, they were all meant to come back in here. That this was going to be an abbot's mausoleum um, and chapel um, underneath the chapter house. But, as so often with temporary arrangements, they were dumped in the South Cloister and left there. And there's only three of their monuments surviving now. There were seven, um, and there was possibly more. 
So um, this, I think, is, is, is the answer, that um, uh, he, he, the abbots were never put in there. It was never used as a chapel. It never became a mausoleum. And it was uh, purloined as um, a treasury. Well, um, in due course, it became other things. Uh, and in fact, uh, a doorway was knocked through there so that the canons who lived out here in canons' houses could use the, the uh, uh, undercroft as their garden shed. Um, and so they kept their tools in there. And John Carter did some wonderful watercolours in the 1790s, uh, uh, um, showing um, uh, people with wheelbarrows and leaning on their forks and so on there. And so, yes, it became, it became the garden store. But one enterprising canon thought this passage is quite useful. So they walled off the top end of it, broke out all the steps, which is why we've got wooden steps there today, and built a wine cellar in there. So it's garden, garden shed and wine cellar for canons. All this was then undone by Gilbert Scott in the 1860s, and it was restored to uh, the, uh, the space that we know it today, except it's now full of furniture. That's a 1933 um, picture. So um, the archaeology of, of this and how um, it, it, it probably inspired Wells and uh, Beverly Minster and so on um, can begin to be glimpsed um, from uh, uh, unpicking this, this story um, uh, at uh, Westminster. Now another area that um, greatly interests me, but which has never been studied in detail, is structural ironwork um, of the Middle Ages. Well, we all know that Salisbury Cathedral Spire has the greatest collection of 14th century ironwork in it to hold it together and the great chain that holds the, the whole of the top of the, the tower together, recorded by um, the Royal Commission and so on. But no one has ever done a study of the 13th century ironwork um, of Henry III um, in Westminster Abbey. And we've got um, here uh, a, a, a very interesting story, and I wrote a bit about it in the, in the Lantern Tower volume, because um, it, the ironwork does impinge on the subject of, of, of the strength of the central tower. Uh, and uh, there is a story here, which I won't go into tonight, but to, to, to explain that um, there are all these great iron ties which link together the columns um, of the, uh, the, the main um, arcades, and they link the columns together and link the columns to the outside wall across the ambulatory. Um, all very necessary, of course, when you're building it, because building huge, tall columns, it's like standing a lot of pencils on their ends. They'll fall over. Uh, you need to link them together and hold them, lock them in place, while you build the arch on top. When the arches, of course, are up, finished, all the mortar set, you could throw these iron bars away. They do nothing. But by great good fortune, they survived at Westminster, um, and, and we've got them all. Not just down at ground level, but they're up here in the Triforium. I've highlighted them in red on there, and the remains of, of them there, which tie together all the shafts and the details of the Triforium openings. And even more interesting, we find that uh, under Wren, when things had moved quite a lot and the central tower, the, the four pillars of the central tower had turned into bananas, they were bowing because the arcades were pushing them in, some of these great ties burst their anchors, these included. Um, and Wren uh, and possibly Hawksmoor were involved in putting new hooks and ends on these ties um, to hold the whole thing together. Uh, because of this problem of the movement of, of the columns uh, uh, in, in the central space. And um, in the chapter house, when we were doing the chapter house volume, we spotted that there are the eight iron hooks still surviving on the capital of the chapter house for the umbrella of iron ties that went out, just as there had been at Salisbury, but which was only destroyed in the mid-19th century, that they actually destroyed all the, the ironwork there, um, although the capital um, is, uh, and, and its uh, uh, fittings at Salisbury still exist as a museum object, um, but not in situ anymore. So um, the uh, understanding the archaeology of construction of the 13th century um, is something, I say, which greatly fascinates me and which there is a lot of evidence um, surviving um, in, in the fabric. Now, of course, like all great schemes uh, uh, that one has, um, they never get finished. I mean, we, we never get there with things. And the crossing tower um, is one of those great unfinished works um, uh, of Westminster. That's what it looks like today. 
um, and when you're in the transept looking across you've just got this this space up uh, uh, here in the, the central area um, above the crossing um, and you've got um, a wooden ceiling and a concrete roof uh, uh, on top of it uh, after of course the, the, um, it was burnt out in 1941. But it had also been burnt out in 1803 when a workman who was doing lead work on the roof left the brazier burning and went off for his lunch and uh, the brazier did more than burn the, the coke in it, it burnt the, the roof off the lantern tower. So there's been a, a history of, of loss and destruction there. But we looked at this very carefully when there was a suggestion a few years ago that maybe the lantern tower would, would be finished, a, a new top built on it. And uh, to my amazement, I realised that inside uh, here we had fragments of the, uh, the Henry III tower still surviving um, uh, in amongst um, Hawksmoor's um, later work that encased it. Now, the Lantern Tower um, is, a, is something which uh, is very complicated. Henry III started it, uh, but he capped it off and left it and went on moving down uh, the, the nave with building and presumably intended to come back and finish the Lantern Tower. Um, Edward I was going to do some work on it, but never got round to it. And then the next thing we know is that um, Abbot Islip's funerary roll of, of 1532 has this drawing in it showing an octagonal lantern and cupola over the crossing. And this reminds us, of course, in a smaller scale, of what um, exists at Ely and what once existed at Peterborough, but has gone, uh, a, a timber lantern. And I suggested, and, and, I, and I drew that to illustrate the details of it, that there was in fact a tower there, and I, and I suggested that it wasn't just artistic license, because they'd gone to the trouble of drawing this sort of detail in, which I think was the squinch arches um, to turn the square of the, uh, the lantern into an octagon to build the octagon on top. What I failed to do at the time, but I've remedied since and put it in the coronation chair book, is point out that Queen Elizabeth's uh, coronation, uh, they built an octagonal uh, throne area to put the coronation chair on underneath this. Um, and so it's the only time um, that there has been an octagonal uh, setting for the coronation as opposed to a square or rectangular one under the crossing. And so I think this plan, which is in the British Library, um, uh, it, it gives us uh, more credence for the, the suggestion that the 1532 drawing is not an artistic invention but is genuine and that we had the Queen crowned uh, on an octagonal plinth under an octagonal lantern uh, uh, above her. So um, the, the, these, these um, elements are all come together to, to help us uh, understand it a little better. We were surveyed in minute detail the whole crossing area and were able to show that, that of course, the arches are Henry III's work and so is that the masonry up to that point. Then this is all Hawksmoor above. But up in the, cor the, 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 cor the four turrets in the, cor in the corner, there are staircases in two of them. And we discover that, in fact, there is the lining, a part, that's the pale yellow bit, the lining of a 13th century stair turret, fragments of it still survive going up inside Hawksmoor's um, turrets. So it looks as though Henry III's tower got a bit higher than we thought it, it had done. But clearly, it was never finished. Uh, and, of course, here is, is part of Henry III's work, um, a, a base for a corner shaft. Um, they're, 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 they're there, so the corner shafts rising up here from little um, corbels with human heads underneath, and they're all still there. Um, uh, never been recorded uh, in detail. Well, the Lantern Tower gives rise to a whole series of proposals, of course. Um, Wren uh, um, built this wonderful model for, uh, for the 400-foot high tower and spire, which was to be the answer to all towers and spires. Um, uh, in, in 1710, he did that. Haw uh, Dickinson and Hawksmoor then produced a huge number of schemes, and we've managed to sort them into a chronological order of, of ideas and proposals and, and how um, uh, these came about. But they, uh, they are, of course, mostly were um, just pie in the sky. They were never achieved. Um, however, we do get to a, a point where we know what Hawksmoor was going to build, and, he, uh, and we have fragments, again, previously unstudied and unpublished, a whole pile of fragments of um, limestone models that were made for Hawksmoor's scheme. This is part of the north transept, um, and this is the springing um, of the uh, crossing arch. 
This is part of, of an external uh, detailing um, on the proposed tower, corner shaft here, um, and again, fragments. They've been put together in a wooden model. So Hawksmoor um, moved on to the point of, of making uh, stone models of what he was going to build, and Pietro Fabris in 1735 and uh, Paul Fordrenier and others drew and have left for us details of the scheme. That's what was being built. Hawksmoor got that far. We've got that string course in. We've got the windows, got the, the towers in at the bottom here, but then stopped at that point. The inconvenience of it was that King George I died uh, in 1727. And so the chapter gave the order that the scaffolding, which they were building away here, the scaffolding had to be dropped by Michaelmas 1727 for the coronation um, of George II. Uh, and then the scaffolding was meant to go back up afterwards and they would have carried on and built that. That was what was planned. However, some bright spark said, shall we build the Western Towers first? So they put the scaffolding up uh, in 1728 on the Western Towers, built those, ran out of money by 1735, never came back and did this. So that is why we have the Western Towers of Hawksmoor's, but not his crossing tower. Well, um, th th this reminds us to, then to, th to think um, uh, of this upper level of the e eastern end of, of, of the abbey. Now, the bit that I've shaded yellow here is the area that is going to become the new uh, museum and gallery, the great high-level gallery all around the eastern uh, 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 triforium. Uh, and that is what we're working towards um, at the moment. Now, we surveyed all this area for the first time ever. There was no plan of it um, ever been produced un until a few years ago. And all that existed were two antiquarian drawings, um, one by Scott, um, or one published by Scott in 1863, um, and, and one other published a bit later. Now, this is a wonderful area up here. Magnificent sculptures surviving and so on, um, to do with a whole upper tier of chapels. And that's what it was conceived as. It wasn't just a triforium space to keep ladders and junk. It was an upper tier of chapels, um, a, a subject which, of course, was very popular in Anglo-Saxon and, and, and Norman periods. But in the 13th century, it went out of favour. And you see several places uh, in the 13th century where they abandoned the construction of second-story chapels. Uh, Wells Cathedral, they were starting to build them in the Western Towers. 1739, they abandoned it. Um, here, it's abandoned... Um, uh, obviously, uh, sorry, 1739. Um, 1239, they abandoned it. Here, it's abandoned in, in the 1250s um, to going on with the chapels. They were never finished. But the structure was built, and we've got that wonderful structure today. Uh, and the, uh, these huge octagonal spaces with um, this is Wren's roof structure put in um, between 1701 and 1718. Wren re roofed everything here. Uh, and put a lot more timbers in but nevertheless we still have these great octagonal spaces and in the course of re-roofing and repairing all these recently we've been able to look at the, uh, the, the evidence for the 13th century roofs the 15th century flat roofs that su succeeded them Wren's roofs of the early 18th century and so on and the evidence all points to the fact that the original um, uh, octagonal uh, chapels would have had high pointed octagonal roofs like we see at Amiens, that it was a whole forest of little pointed octagons which were then chopped off in the 15th century um, to, to flatten uh, the, the whole of this area. Well, um, it, it goes on um, and there is much more that one could say and I'll say a little more and then I will stop. Um, down below, at ground level, another area that has required a, a, a lot of thought and is, is requiring it now is the whole business of the, the sanctuary um, and the shrine area, all of this. There's a lot of problems that have been glossed over in architectural history to do with this. Um, for a start, um, when uh, the, 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 confessor, uh, the confessor's church had an apse that was just underneath here, there's foundations of it have been seen under the, the, the Cosmarty pavement just there. How on earth did Henry III, in, in 1220, when he built his Lady Chapel out here, how on earth was that joined to the Confessor's Church? There's a link that's totally missing. Obviously, there was a structural link, uh, and that's a, a story for uh, another day. But there had to be a link, um, and it's never been adequately thought about. Then there's the interesting problem that um, although this um, eastern part of the, 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 the church was built by Henry III in its present form from 1246 through to the 1250-ish, early 1250s, 
The great Cosmati pavement here wasn't laid until 1268. So what did you stand on? What happened? Where was, was the high altar there? What, what was going on between, uh, say, 1250 and 1268? Uh, and then the same sort of problem relates to the shrine area. There are these lacunae in our knowledge of the development of, of, of the building. So they are all areas that um, we are trying to address through various archaeological inquiries um, at the moment. And we have, uh, the next volume we shall bring out from Westminster will be the volume on the, 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 the main Cosmati pavement, the big one, not the shrine one, the, the, the sanctuary pavement. Now, this again had conundrums associated with it, because in this great pavement there are, there are these two things which are said to contain the burials of Abbot Wenlock and Abbot Ware um, under here. Abbot Ware was the man who went to Rome and brought back the marblers who laid the pavement. But he didn't die until long after the pavement was laid. So how do you bury two abbots in, in a great mosaic pavement? There is Ware's tomb before, uh, before and after uh, cleaning all the gunge and polish off it recently. Well, we had to find an archaeological answer to this. And, to, and it seemed obvious to me when you looked at, uh, at this, this tomb that in, in fact it must be that it was actually a coffin lid in one piece that you would lift off a coffin um, and, and put the body in and then put the lid back. But how do you get this lid out without destroying the pavement around it? Well, when you look at it carefully, you see that there's a line of Cosmati work down there which is very poor. Bits and bobs, badly laid out, far too much mortar, and there it is down there, too. So, in fact, they are sacrificial strips, and with the investigations we carried out, we were able to show that these lines, um, uh, which I've just split up as a solid line, but you've taken it all to bits, one cube at a time, um, we were able to show that you dug out these strips, these sacrificial strips, you then discovered that in the slot underneath them, there were iron links, which you could lift up, put bars through, lift the lid out, um, pop the body in, drop the lid back, and reconstruct the sacrificial strips. Uh, so this uh, has all been uh, now established during the course of the conservation work and the investigations we carried out. So that it's answered um, a question that uh, was uh, 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 you know, bugging us uh, for a very long time, and which most people sort of chose to uh, uh, skate over. But in the course of repairs and removing cement patches and so on from the pavement, we were able to find the, the corner of the coffin lid there, the top of the coffin is showing there, and one of the iron links we found it, it, there and then proved the others existed by um, uh, doing um, uh, a, a, a metal detector survey. So that it all um, sorted out in the end. The, the shrine pavement is the area that we are currently devoting our attentions to. And Tim Tatton Brown um, and the Royal Commission have done work on this. The Commission produced an early plan of it. Tim produced this analysis um, of the uh, plan published in the BAA proceedings some years ago, 1998. Uh, we've re-surveyed it and looked at, uh, at the, the layout in quite, uh, recently um, in minute detail and now begun to study the whole problem of the relationship of the pavement to the architectural frame and to the tombs and to the shrine. What comes first? What's the order in which all these things are constructed? Because there isn't a date for this pavement. The other pavement out there is 1268, but we don't actually have a date for this pavement. Um, I mean, it might, it might be 1269, uh, which is what's often said, uh, and, and the shrine. However, it's constructed in an utterly different fashion, using a, a, a different technique uh, and using a different type of mortar and so on from the, uh, from the great pavement. So um, we can't say that the two are necessarily contemporary. We need to investigate and demonstrate it. I mean, I regard it as, as open. So, um, uh, with great help from David Neal, who is our um, sort of leading expert on Roman mosaics and has drawn and published every Roman mosaic in Britain in four great volumes, uh, David kindly offered to come and study the, the two great mosaics here um, at Westminster. And he's been with me today in there. And we have been able to investigate the structure um, of the mosaics um, uh, as, as we've gone. And this is the first... Uh, ele element of the drawing he produced on the shrine pavement where he has not put in any of the, the decorative work that is the matrix, that is the Purbeck marble matrix into which all the decoration is inlaid and from which we can see that in fact the matrix is made up of lots of rectangles and squares of Purbeck paving 
So, in fact, the possibility exists that the pavement in the shrine was actually just a plain Purbeck marble floor into which the design was then chiselled and then the, the, the decorative mosaic inlaid. Uh, in fact, it was done that way. There's no question the chiselling in was done in situ as opposed to the other pavement, which was brought in pieces and assembled as a jigsaw, putting it all together. So very, very different in their uh, technique. And then the, 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 the drawing has been filled with every uh, surviving cube of um, marble and glass mosaic. And again, there's a lot of glass in this mosaic, a um, great deal of glass. Um, and, and so the evidence fully recorded uh, of the designs that we've got there. For the first time, again, it's something which has never been uh, tackled before, despite the fact that these are the only two great Cosmati pavements um, in Britain. Uh, and they give rise to understanding um, a, a lot more about the way the chapel was used and the relationship of, of the pavements um, to the various monuments. And uh, we are able to see now, because the, 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 the pavements, in fact, have a, have a corner turning in, in them there under the tomb of Edward I and under the tomb of uh, Richard the, uh, the Third here, um, Richard II, sorry, um, uh, here, um, there's a corner and an angle, angle there. We can see that, in fact, the pavement were laid in three, three, three goes. There's a carpet of pavement was laid across there, then two separate carpets laid across here. This, one, this north one first, then, then that one. And so it, uh, it at last gives us some indication of how to see the chapel being used. Because how did you get in? How did pilgrims circulate around this? How did it work? Well, I think we, we can now see from the various bits of scar evidence and so on that we went up staircases, we had this arrangement, and we could go around the, the, the shrine and down another stair. A, a circulation of pilgrims, as one would expect to see. Uh, but the, 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 the evidence is, is there. Well, we've gone on and we've looked at other things. Um, the Royal Commission put that on its plan. The, the missing sacristy, the great sacristy. The lesser sacristy is in St. Faith's Chapel, which is, which is down there. But the, the, the great sacristy was demolished in the 18th century. Uh, and uh, the, the Royal Commission put it on. And we wondered how much evidence there was for it. And so when Time Team asked me if they could come and do some digging um, at the Abbey, I thought, aha, um, I'll get a free excavation on the site of the, uh, uh, the, the missing sacristy, uh, which we did. A 19th century plan, which is what the Commission had used to, to, to work from. Uh, uh, we, uh, when we did the, uh, the, the radar and other surveys of the ground, there it appeared, there, there was the, as the outer wall, that's that wall there. There's the inner wall there, that appears, um, and the retur returns down here. So we were able to plot it by um, geophysical methods, and then to carry out um, an excavation to establish um, that, uh, only, only limited, of course, in the time team, but establish um, its true dimensions and position on the ground. And, of course, it's all part of a great complex of buildings that were stood here on the north side of the abbey, which were demolished about which, with things like Holler's drawing, enable us to reconstruct. We can work out that this great sacristy um, had probably in the 15th century crenellated parapets added to it, it had domestic windows put in because the sacristan lived upstairs in it, and it had a garden wall and gate probably also of the 15th century um, put, uh, built in front of it. And it was part of this great building in um, all around the abbey of various houses and, and so on, uh, which uh, encased the abbey and they were all demolished um, in the 1740s and thereafter. Well, I've gone through quite a, a long journey um, uh, 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 and uh, taken far too much time, but uh, the archaeology of understanding uh, Westminster Abbey is something which I think is utterly um, vital. Um, it's, I hope, now on a better footing than it has been, uh, or certainly was, before Tim Tappan Brown um, uh, started the, the modern uh, uh, work there. But if we look all the way back to Gilbert Scott, when he had to apologise to the Dean and Chapter, um, uh, if I am sometimes troublesome in this matter of archaeology, well, I, I have to say that too to the Dean and Chapter today when I am being a complete pain and wanting to do something. And, and there, I think we should leave it, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President. Thank you so much.